the session here. Um, we are at FSCons in Gothenburg, 2015. And uh, we are going to hear Leandros Savinis talk about 3D printing in hackspaces as uh, he talks of production. And he will introduce himself. Uh, yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, First, just a, a, a brief introduction to what I'm going to speak, because I know that in the website I don't specify what is it about, so it's not a technical thing. Uh, the paper is basically an unfinished attempt, a draft attempt, to engage with my traveling between the printing. Do you have in, a microphone? Uh, no. Uh, you should have a microphone, so we get it on the tape. Okay. Um, is there no, no microphone? No, there hasn't been a microphone in this room. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well done. That's okay. Yeah. You can understand from my gesture. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, all right. So it's a, it's an attempt to engage uh, theoretically and politically my traveling between the printing hack spaces for the past uh, six months or so. So no slides for me today. Only talking. I hope I don't. Not nobody gets asleep. Uh, I, will, I will try to use some phone, uh, and uh, I, I hope to bring something interesting in terms of how we think social movements and how they intersect uh, in, in science and technology uh, communities. So, uh, who's who's familiar with the term heterotopia? Okay, okay. So, excuse me, but I, I, I will I will uh, just use. Uh, well, uh, some time to, to explain what it is uh, first. Okay, and I begin with a quote by Michel Foucault uh, in, a, in a, a lecture he gave about other spaces. Each heterotopia has a precise and determined function within society, and the same heterotopia can, according to the synchrony of the culture in which it occurs, have one function or another. So the paper will draw from Foucault's concept of heterotopia because this specific concept is utilized to demonstrate how power reproduces spatially through social relations and usually is the basis, consciously or unconsciously, of how social movements try to intervene in the civil society. But when we talk about uh, uh, hack spaces, we also talk about spaces where value extraction is happening, spaces that are thought of as leisure spaces, spaces that people go and play, they intersect with different interests between science and technology, but at the same time they produce. Okay, so Foucault gives a, 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 a specific uh, definition for, uh, for uh, uh, heterotopias as places that they exist as countersites, a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites, all the other real sites that can be found within a culture, are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. And bear with me a few minutes, I will explain what that means. So hack spaces and maker spaces are spaces of production and of leisure time. They arose from the fringes of, of, of culture and uh, fringes of uh, how we consume everyday space and everyday materials in our late capitalist societies. Heterotopias are spaces of otherness. They are spaces which constitute themselves on the basis of their difference to what is considered to be normal. They exist because of their difference. In contrast to utopias, they do exist in reality, albeit in a divergent spatial-temporal configuration. They are in between spaces in which the norms of contemporary society do not apply as they provide an alternative social ordering. And here you can think about the bio, uh, the biohack lab that you mentioned yesterday, in which protocols do not apply. Yes, uh, some some protocols do not apply. Sorry. <laughs> Yet in their deviation. They do reflect the society in which, in which they are uh, operating. So you have to register, the law has to recognize you, and so on and so on. So what is the function then of a hack space within modern societies? Do they even have a specific function? Or perhaps they are spaces without function within our contemporary societies. My proposal today 
is that hack spaces serve a variety of functions according to their members on the subjective level, but there is one objective factor that gives them modern, uh, that gives them purpose in modern society. And that purpose is the breathing space of a system that desperately needs its outside. Recuperation is the function of the capitalist system to engulf its own critique. And I will explain this in a bit. In other words, many hack spaces function as useful pools of talent, experimentation and creativity that the present situation of the capitalist crisis does not allow either the public or the private sector to invest, but which is deemed absolutely necessary for the continuation of the system. The paper seeks to open the discussion on what are the theoretical presuppositions of such recuperation. And if we look back in history, the different collectives of the 1970s, most of them they got recuperated, some of them died, some of them uh, became uh, big conglomerates. So I, I, I'm trying to rethink the uh, present predicament uh, using this theory of recuperation that Johann Sonderberg put uh, forth. He's in the other room now, but at some point I hope he, he uh, comes in order to, uh, to discuss a bit. Um, so, this results in, in systematic extraction of value of the corporate world on user innovation. There is an increase in trends, uh, I would call, through uh, my specific area, 3D printing with these other spaces. Hack spaces are the heterotopias of 21st, uh, of 21st century manufacturing. And central to the understanding of hack spaces, since we are talking about uh, speciality uh, and uh, social movements, uh, is, the, is the concept uh, of Foucault on how he understands uh, power and resistance. So, understanding Foucault on, uh, on power and resistance, we should say that he uses a, a method called genealogy. This is because Foucault, in contrast with other modernist methodologies of describing history, such as the one offered by Habermas, which is in, in social sciences, it's a, a it's a very uh, popular thing, the, the, unfinished, uh, the unfinished project of enlightenment, yes, reason and progress. Uh, and the historical materialist one, which Marxists adhere to. So, if they are chiological methods, the idea that uh, history is, is fragmented and progress is not a linear, uh, is not a linear process, so that we can find different, uh, different practices of the past in the present, as Foucault did in the past, on the assumption that ideas and truths are produced within apparatuses with their own internal logic. So in a way, uh, what was proposed is that reason all is also containing myths. Yes, we are not modern in the sense that we think we are for Foucault. Yes, so the task falling on where this discursive discontinuities begin and end, genealogy is the attempt to have a closer scrutiny on how these objectives are uh, predicated on power, knowledge, and the body, on how this, uh, this thing we call reason is predicated on power and resistance, for example. So, in his earlier work, Foucault can be understood as a theoretician of tropes, fragmented periods of structures whereby ideas are developed. In the latter stages of his academic life, the genealogic method gives excessive importance on how power is exercised, essentially losing faith in the quasi-structuralist approach of his earlier days. Using genealogy, and this is the point I want to stress, experience of power becomes much more important than theory. Foucault is inspired by Nietzsche and shares the assumption that the scrutiny of objectivity through practices, ideas, and power relations can show subjective motivations. Thus, truth becomes negotiable. History as a science is denied. There are no laws of history according to this understanding. Everything becomes a game of power and resistance. What is considered to be the norm in societies is the work of professional groupings who establish the normal. 
Foucault does not analyze power in terms of economic systems, but in terms of practices. Speciality for Foucault has a central role on how power and discipline is experienced. According to him, power has no centers, but rather in a multiplicity of relations and on many levels. And you might recognize this on the discussions about decentralization. How space is organized, lived, dissected, classified, experienced, and so on is predicated on the idea that modern societies are able to discipline by individualizing and making the subject visible. Such an understanding of power suggests that resistance is never in position of exteriority in relation to power. Identities, normalities, and how knowledge is organized then becomes a matter of how subjects are organized in spaces. Under such an approach, despite power cannot be diminished by an outside, let's say another system, it nevertheless gives the individual and social subjects the possibility to fight existing injustices and narrow identities in places of reproduction of the system, engaging with the many layers of relations in which power manifests itself. So since life is mediated uh, through normalcies and institutions where power relations are manifested, then it becomes apparent that the proposition of hacking and hack spaces offering to open spaces and discussions of knowledge to non-professional groupings seems or is a radical proposal. So, hack spaces and twin printing. I assume that uh, most of you know what uh, hack space is. So, let's say, hack spaces consist of people that are constantly creating, building, modulating, tinkering, mixing existing technologies and structures, but at the same time forced to adopt institutional logic as a way to integrate and spread. So you need, for example, to complete the forms in order to open the hack space. There are spaces where hacking the creative engagement of the non-professional public with science and technology is encouraged. There are, in other words, other spaces. They constitute a departure from the from what could be associated as a space of division of labor and production, spaces that where professionals are engaging within their special training fields. And this does not mean that there are no professionals in hack spaces, but that uh, the spaces are open to non professionals. These spaces are predicated on post physical imaginaries as they connect with other spaces in virtual worlds and engage in, alter in alternative time and space paradigms. It is no coincidence, for example, that many hack spaces seduce people through their social media accounts rather than face-to-face -face neighborhood meetups. They are regarded as spaces of resistance to the diminishing quality of life, mostly in advanced modern societies or waiting rooms to enter, or they are uh, considered as waiting rooms to enter markets in future times. Some sort of mystical outlook prohibits the outside viewer to describe them as spaces of production and to analytically scrutinize them in such a way. They are rather being enacted as science and technology experiences and practices that can be included in a wide variety of narratives allowing in culture. With hack spaces on the rise, the post-industrial imaginaries that govern the developed world since the 1970s has passed the time. Within hack spaces, Generation M, as it's called by some, learns again how to build, how to create with material using one of the most potentially disrupting manufacturing technologies, 3D printing. Despite the technology being utilized since the mid 80s, only recently attracted attention, much to the extent work done by hobbyists and hackers and the prevalence of 3D printing in such spaces. The technology allows users to create objects without being relied upon third-party companies since design and creation uh, of the object can be done on a desktop. A process that could take up from weeks to months can be done in days. It therefore allows the production of various objects in spaces considered to be places of play rather than of work, <laughs> creating an environment where innovation can spread from R&T labs and universities to public and community spaces. But 3D printing is not only a technological tool. It symbolizes fluidity, flexibility, as part of the idea of the market and the construction of, of this uh, flexibility. A vital concept of the new economy 
the neoliberal, if we say the, the, the yesterday's uh, keynote speaker, yeah, uh, on which demand and uh, on which on demand and customization are important concepts, whereas at the at the same time embodying the material and economic relations and cultural interactions of our societies. Within hack spaces, one can find the seeds of an alternative production paradigm, either as an evolution or in stark contract to the existing one. They mostly concern cultural reproduction and engagement of the public, as we said, with science and technology, as they are spaces of capitalist reproduction, who also affect the normal capitalist spaces, if we say the factories, where production is carried out. In the UK, one can find such spaces near city centers, in many instances, in areas which utilize the term cultural quarters, which is usually the mark of former industrial or semi-industrial areas of cities which now stand in ruins. Cheaper access in terms of rent is something the authorities are using to supposedly show support for such ventures, without meaning that in many instances, hack spaces have serious budget problems. In fact, the EU, an institution committed on spreading the capitalist basis of our societies is not only in favor of such an idea, but secures funds for the creation of such phases. This could be taken lightly, talking about democracy and values, but we can also look at what the EU and the industry give us as an explanation in their reports. And I'm quoting from the economic and scientific policy on the open innovation in industry and 3D printing. So far, Social innovation and technological innovation have not been linked in a promising way. 3D printing, especially in the context of Fab Labs, gives a unique opportunity to make young people more interested in and aware of the potential of technologies and to overcome the expected scarcity in qualified workforce. Open innovation strategies provide tools to bring together large companies, small and medium companies, public authorities and customers to work out smart specialization strat strategies. Fab Labs have the potential to combine open innovation strategies and locally committed cooperation between makers, craft machines, or cultural industries. In other words, delegating the risk of unemployment to individuals at the same time as taking ideas from their work, spreading the risk of innovation to the users rather than paying for it, as they used to do in other dealers. Such spaces, if we take the Marxist understanding of capitalism, are non-productive spaces, because labor and wealth produced here is not directly utilized or dictated by capital. So capital does not divide or uh, uh, decides what is to be produced in, in hard spaces. This was not the opinion of Marx, but his understanding of how capital utilizes human labor. Human labor having meaning only if it's going to uh, produce any profit. Yes? I want to argue that despite such spaces started as such, as ventures or people who are interested in something, not dictated by capital, capital increasingly finds its way to combine this outside source of innovation by recuperating and combining it with productive labor in order to enhance value creation and thus profit. There are spaces where people in the past have invested a great amount of time in the basement of their houses or their garage, alone or with some friends that come to meet uh, uh, new people and create in a multiplicity of ways. <clears throat> so, who can we find in, in hack spaces, fab labs and, and makers? And I should note that despite the some differences, I use uh, all of the three uh, all of the three terminologies uh, together because I think that uh, in terms of spacing, uh, they provide uh, they are essentially the same. Uh, so one can find people who are employed in giant corporations who are, uh, who are interested to work on their own projects in, uh, without the bureaucracies of capital, independent jewelry makers and businesses who do their creative work and prototypes in these safe spaces, university students who are able to use the machines and space for the assignment projects 
without having to fill the forms uh, imposed by the university, people who just hang around with their own projects. The common denominator of all these heterogeneous types of individuals is their engagement, engagement with science and technology. So drawing from the ethnographic research I conducted the past six months, social media and online platforms play an important role in the gathering and the setup of such spaces. They do not constitute, the spaces do not constitute the political subject, as is also uh, mentioned by uh, Johann Sonderberg uh, in their special edition on hacking, uh, uh, hacking, hacking hacked. They are rather a heterogeneous collection of individuals whose motivation and interests intersect at some point in time and space. The engagement with their common interests in science and technology is the unifying factor, one that marks the issue of class in our societies, since in many of them the issue of access is tackled in various ways, and many times informally. Access, instead of a political and social problem, becomes a technical one, which once tackled either with lowering membership fees or any other help, the political ceases to exist. Hack spaces, which I have been present either as a member or as a guest in the Midlands region in the UK, the industrial belts of the UK, or former in some areas, began as a way of people with similar interests to join forces and have their own space of experimentation. Many have been university educated that have some technical training, something which presupposes a specific social background. The access of participants to the premises rests on the individual's free time and proximity to the space, usually many members living quite, uh, 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 quite far from the site having to commute there, uh, 20, 30 minutes or even more. Individual problems uh, of everyday life stay with the persons that carry them as they enter the hack space, provide an access to tools and possibly friends. Not hacking, making produces a feeling of awkwardness as the space culture feeds on the idea that members need to do something. So this is uh, kind of the ideology in, in many of these spaces. I'm not saying all, but many of them. Some spaces organize more as in innovation incubators, usually those who start with much capital, such as the Cambridge one, while others have much more practical organization. Some emphasize their production of democratic practices as they celebrate general meetings, while others consider meetings as chores, practical problems that need to be done. Many users of 3D printing do their prototypes there, as rules and regulations uh, of the industry virtually do not exist. It is a cheap way to produce low volume production, which then can test in marketplaces platforms and other, uh, and other uh, online devices. It is a ch uh, uh, no. So in such a way, hack spaces become spaces of production in the classic understanding of the term, since labor done is mediated by the price mechanism within uh, marketplaces. In some, in some instances, people do not even produce their own prototypes, but, but prototypes of objects that big corporations are in need so they can market themselves for potential partnerships or, and jobs in the future. Some corporations, by making donations or promises to such spaces, can also dictate uh, some projects that members uh, ought to carry out in order to secure funding. Thus, capital can also directly or indirectly di dictate activity in such spaces. The protection of each space to corporations is a matter of negotiation within the members. The more a hack space is dependent on corporations, the less freedom it has on democratizing science and technology and working on the needs rather for the profit of others. And I should note here that uh, I had a, a different experience in, uh, in fabulous St. Pauli story. St. Pauli is a historic uh, area in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, which uh, uh, has an activist past, and the story of their fab lab is rather different. The space was not created as part of the city's plan for redevelopment, nor for out of the interest of certain individuals to come together and practice science and technology, 
but rather as an anti-gentrification demonstration. Who is familiar with gentrification? Okay, a few. When the authorities decided to sell a public space and a few buildings for commercial purposes, people from the area have occupied this, the space and refused to leave. The idea of creating a fab lab came only afterward when the people who blocked the commercialization of the premises decided on what to do with the space, on how it could be useful to the needs of the people rather than for corporate profits. The different origins of the particular fab lab has already, I think, has already been engraved on its DNA. It's uh, almost three years that they started. Access to the space is ensured as most of the users of the space are living within the neighborhood and personal problems are carried in the spaces to become collective problems. Characteristic examples are the meetings of the Right to the City network on how uh, to help welcome refugees that, that take place in the, in the same space as a teenager tries to print, to 3D print an exoskeleton he saw in a movie called Elysium. Or the explanation of the concept of social factory, the idea that the factory has moved from the, uh, from the workshops to the whole of society, to the people that are interested in using the space. People are not only encouraged to 3D print, to make, to hack, but 3D printers are part of a discussion on how to rethink production in relation with the city, its people, and governance. Despite mostly needed in, de in developing countries, hack spaces flourish mostly in countries with cheap flow of electronic devices. Characteristic is the spread of different charities, some of them coming from the UK, uh, but mainly from Western countries who more often than not are trying to teach people or train people in the developing uh, world, such as in Africa, on how to make a living or print exoskeletons for the amputated hands of children in war-torn areas. War, uh, war is then becomes like a technical problem instead of a social one. So, one can find hack spaces looking back at the 70s or perhaps in different form in the 70s with the political communities that sprang up in the West with very different demands, it is a movement nonetheless that gained momentum in times of crisis. Why the hack space culture in the Western world? Nick Dyer Whiteford, in, in his book Cyber Proletariat, problematized the material basis of our consumer societies. And I think uh, this is an interesting discussion on, on what we are talking about here. Namely, how have extraction of materials in Africa different industrial production zones in the world such as in China and cheap flow materials and electronic devices in places such as Europe and the US are connected organically. It is one world system. He was not the first to point it out, but his contribution is important in unmasking the working of this process, demonstrating that the capitalist system hasn't changed in a substantial way, merely in its secondary characteristics. The hacker culture is possible on, on the cheap flow of goods in the Western world. It could not happen otherwise. A characteristic example in the makers' movement, taking its name from a magazine in the US, and the FabLab network growing out of the vision of, a, of an academic in MIT. The idea, though, that, soci that societal deviants can appropriate the wealth created and rework on it how they please without adhering to society's norms or government regulations probably reminds us something we romanticized for years in the past, piracy. So what about pirate organizations? Hack spaces resemble uh, pirate organizations, I claim. Piracy makes sense where civilizations occur. They deviate from the norm upon which they fit themselves, but piracy during the capitalist mode of production is interesting because of its relation to the system it supposedly subverts. And I'm quoting from Durand and Verne. Modern pirates appear in pivotal periods in history, when capitalists began to spread along the trading routes towards the Indies, when radio opened an era of mass communication, 
when the internet became part of the global economy, when the biotech revolution began bumbling to the surface. And it's no coincidence that these four golden ages of piracy correspond to major turning points in the history of capitalism. In fact, they argue, piracy could very well be one of the drivers of capitalism's growth and evolution. So just, and in quote, so just as pirates show up in historical periods where there is an organized mode of production, since themselves are not creating the wealth, but appropriate and reworking on it, acting on the reproduction rather than on production, so hack spaces presuppose societies that they already have established a mode of production where tools are available. In other words, only when the consumer society finds itself in a predicament where there is an endless supply of cheap electronics and on the other hand an increasing de deindustrialization process, the hack spaces start to have meaning in our societies. Garage workshops, you, uh, backyards, all spaces that used to be con uh, considered spaces of resistance with users experimenting in many situations having visions of alternative futures to capitalism have, as they matured since the 70s, either been co-opted, became new giant industries, or died out, with the exception of, of some which remained as a small group at the fringes, incapable of inspiring social change. So why am I talking then about heterotopias? Hack spaces are composing simultaneously in a physical space the virtual social media worlds that connect people with the same general interests in science and technology or particular technical interests. They challenge the notion that knowledge is only for experts, but at the same time, they undermine the role of our universities as they increasingly be converted from institution of knowledge to producers of labor, skills, and information for the extraction of uh, profit from corporations. Hack spaces constitute heterotopias as they can be used as open source technical libraries, an accumulation of time through the combined leisure time of the participants pursuing their own needs in a capitalist world where knowledge is expensive and extensively used for the sole purpose of making profit. But we can also talk about temporary heterotopias through maker fairs and festivals in which one enters a world of creation where making is celebrate, uh, celebrated as if outside them inaction is the guiding principle of our modern world. Insofar as they're pressuring the system to open, they themselves become penetrable by capital as the increased interest of, for example, DARPA and the military educational industrial complex towards them show. The ship, the ship for Foucault, is the heterotopia par excellence. In civilization without boats, says Foucault, dreams dry up, espionage takes the place of adventure, and the police take the, the place of pirates. In the case of hack spaces, the presence of someone at this hack space is not limited to, on one's ability to attend physically, but also on virtual presence and of equal importance, the acceptance of the hack space idea, the idea that moves, which provides an important social leverage in the political economy of hope. Hack spaces can be used as illusions of freedom and participation in our increasingly uh, societies of control and commodification, providing, as, as science and technology often do, a unifying concept in our class societies. So what is my purpose in this paper? Definitely not to smash hope. Then. I want to show that we are not only in this together. Something which is so common that is often forgotten. Class societies with conflicts taking place in everyday life uh, are not immune to these spaces uh, that we are talking about. What we usually see in the political arena at least is that technology is used as a unifying factor, sometimes forgetting that societal problems are not technical per se, but problems of social injustice and exploitation. So after setting this forth, there are two options that have been tried so far. The first is to try radical political alternatives to the management of player spaces, how people participate, have access, make decisions, etc., without much thinking much on the economic possibilities. 
something that we see radical political parties do. The other is to try radical economic alternatives, such as P2P networks and solidarity economies, thinking that if we set up our own networks between or within the market and the state, we will not be dependent on big centralized corporations. Looking at the politics of the world, these alternatives fail to provide a compact vision for social change, despite that on a local level, they may manage to solve some issues and pose a few cracks. Sometimes we have both, but uh, I claim that the, uh, that the answer may lie uh, elsewhere. So in tax spaces, one can see the emergence of a society of commons, yet the spaces themselves cannot overcome their mirror, the society they reflect and which they participate. This is because they act in a sphere of circulation of materials and reproduction of the system, rather than on the exploitation at the point of production. Hack spaces are both sides at the same time. They're both sides of circulation and sides of production. <coughs> they constitute heterotopias as long as uh, they, they, uh, they function within the capitalist society where private property is the foundation and profit the purpose of our societies. In the society based on the commons, they will serve no purpose. They will not be heterotopic. They provide an essential alternative space of the capitalist system, but more of them does not mean changing the system, as they cannot replace political will. They do not constitute an outside, but rather a margin. And this is where I think that our concept of power is lacking. So perhaps what they can provide best is what Greek architect Stavros Tavridis called as passages towards otherness. Hack spaces can provide windows to an alternative future. These potential windows function and can function for accumulating political will for social change or, as potential, uh, or, or else they can function as potential renewers in capitalist societies through recuperation in times of systemic crisis and the failure of the system to reproduce itself. Their contradictory nature is what, give them, what gives them uh, the possibility of hope, but it is also their <coughs> own nemesis. So by thinking hack spaces as heterotopias, and I, I, I should start finishing, um, so as spaces of both cultural reproduction and production of, of materials and objects, one is to try and spread power spatially eventually thinking that all the cracks do not allow the system to control completely. But I contend that such ventures are ventures that if taken by themselves as ontologically something different without a robust political movement that challenges the capitalist economic basis of the society in terms of political power, so to challenge the system politically where exploitation happens, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, have success. I argue that a solution becomes the politicization of hack spaces, making them spaces where people not only get an interest on how the world functions, but to also engage in political collectives, in political collectives who potentially can challenge the centers of power, those who own the means of production, that is the large industries, transportation, the fiber cables, the servers, the electricity, the water uh, infrastructures. Thank you. I hope it was not too much. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, all right. My question is this. Do you, I really enjoy the optimism of the, like, what you're saying, but wouldn't the the um, wouldn't that space actually exist at this beginning of the supply chain? Like, wouldn't Foucault say that it can't really exist at the end point because that's simply like producing the object, but like the raw materials are the thing that still strangleholds like the ultimate optimism that you're looking at, like that that future. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can't control the production of the raw materials that we use in these spaces then really you're still just like completely, uh, you know, attached to like the corporations that have access yeah. to like the massive 
uh, equipment and overhead that it requires to get the raw materials. So when I, th I just feel like Foucault might say like that that space actually really truly needs to begin at that like lowest level. Yes. So what I'm trying to, to say here is to try to engage with hack spaces because I like the idea of hack spaces without crushing hope. Because I don't think that more of local can result in big changes. It is, it, you know, getting to scale up, it simply is not arithmetic. You have to, to look at many different things. Yeah. yeah. So what we did so far is to try a radical political imaginaries in the parliament, or even worse, at the EU parliament, yeah? Mm -hmm. So try to engage with this, uh, with this system by trying to pass laws, yeah? And at the same time, try to have our own networks. So I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, many people have both, yeah? Mm -hmm. But I think that this is the wrong strategy. In the past, the, the, um, the answer to this was working class movement. And this is what I wanted to say, but uh, perhaps uh, if, if I continue to write this, I, I will write it in the, in the, when I finish it. But uh, what, what I, I really try to say is that uh, these spaces should see themselves as part of the working class movement rather than as spaces of safety for the members, for the individual interests of the members. In such a way, the small acts that they do, yeah, the enjoyment that they do, it also will result in, 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 uh, in getting a, a growing political will that can challenge the, the raw uh, material extraction. I mean, the working class movement in the past was internationalist. Mm -hmm. You could have a strike in, in, in the UK, and by solidarity you could have a strike in France. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, this, this race in, in, in class consciousness, which is it's not an ideology, it's an objective fact that we have class societies, yeah? We have inequality in our societies. So what I think is that if we can use hack spaces and all this creativity that we, we see in, in hack spaces, instead of letting them to recuperate because they will be dependent on corporations, to raise this class consciousness, mm -hmm. yeah? To think of them, uh, for example, when people think about networks, to not only think networks as just some graph of different people interacting with each other, but thinking networks in terms of where is the server, yeah? Don't think about the server as you know just something given or that you know it's cheap now. You know? Don't take this political economy of this uh, pagan life or, or uh, where do fibers uh, pass from? Yeah? These are political decisions that I think that the movement can challenge. I mean, it's kind of the same uh, conflict. It's just that the means of production have changed. Now it's cognitive means of production and yeah. creative workers, probably with the more manual and physical industrial. But it's the same conflict. Who, who controls the means of production? Is yes. it free software or is it the pro controlled proprietary software and so on? Mm. For instance. So I, I think that the, the free uh, software movement, um, although it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a possibility that it opens up the potential, I think it does not go to the root. Does not question the, the it does not actually question the means of, uh, of production, and I say this, given that uh, uh, I, I support the free software movement, but I think that it forgets to think in terms of of, uh, of real politics in terms of uh, the, the big scale up. Mm -hmm. yeah? So it forgets to think about why wars happen. It forgets to you know challenging uh, uh, patterns, but it accepts rent, for example, in housing. Yeah? So it didn't find, I think that the free software movement was not able to find itself within the rest of society. It kind of remained uh, on its own. And uh, it conflated this idea that information plays uh, an increasingly part with the idea that uh, profit is extracted from information rather from, from labor. Yeah? So yes, information play, plays a, a lot of part, but we need people, we need to exploit people in order to to, to make profit. So in a way, you know, yes, it, you know, capital is change, it, it, it uses computers. But if you have a, a computer, you don't own the means of production. Yeah? You, you are not able to intervene in the production sphere, but in the circulation. And there are many people who, uh, due to the nature of their work, like journalists, for example, that uh, they're in between, yeah? some freelancing, and I can understand 
uh, when they when they try to set up different networks for let's say uh, counter information. But I don't think that the problem of the world is that people do not have sufficient information. I think that uh, uh, there are many people who do know exactly what is uh, going on. I don't think that people are stupid. But I think, uh, but you know, political movements are not only about you know what is happening. It's also about raising this class consciousness. Uh, I, well, I don't know if I answered that yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I think in my experience of in, in the London hack space is a kind of fierce opposition to politicization, right? A kind of attempt to keep things apolitical. Yeah. Um, and I think in a hope of keeping things, uh, keeping an innocence that fosters the creativity that kind of brings people there in the first place. So by using it as a political stage, you know, then maybe you're losing, you might, you're maybe in danger of losing the kind of creativity that brought it into existence in the first place. Mm. But, you know, something that I ask people when I, when I go to hack spaces, uh, what happens, let's say, uh, one way of politicizing, let's say, the bio, uh, the bio lab, yeah, the bio hack lab, yeah. is about bringing the, the division of labor within uh, professional labs, you yeah? know? We know that what happens uh, with intellectual patterns, what happens with the selling of enzymes, what happens with the stress, of different biologies, it remains within them. They don't talk about it. So I think a way to politicize, it's it's not just to take stance that, you know, uh, here we are only anarchist or socialist or whatever, but it's also to bring the everyday problems, yeah, the work problems of how biology it's it's constructed on an everyday basis mm -hmm. for profit and not for the for the needs. Yeah. So uh, there are many ways to politicize it. And I think that uh, people forget uh, that uh, politics is not just, you know, a party that uh, is just making some suggestions in a parliament. Yeah? Politics is about the everyday experience of people. So, you know, it's, it's how you can say that. Apolitical, I think it's also a political stance altogether. <laughs> so what happens, let's say, in, in hack spaces if the government tries to tax more, uh, more of the internet in such spaces? I asked a hacker about this. And he told me, you know what, uh, we are hackers, we'll find a way out. But this is an individual, an individualist position. Mm -hmm. You may find your way out, but you know, it's a social problem. It's, it's not going to go away. You know? So in a way, we, we have to act on this. And so there are, I think there are many ways to create, creatively act with politics as well, uh, without estranging people. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not the one who will give recipes. <laughs> Yeah. That maybe this idea of the apolitical is a uh, uh, defense not getting claustrophobic because sometimes, uh, you know, with this idea of co, you know, with the uh, power capital everywhere, it's easy to get claustrophobic and dystopic and, and he, is, uh, uh, he doesn't see change. So, but then you have to remember also that uh, uh, when he was uh, writing this, his students made a 68 movement in, six, in, in Paris. So he can't predict. He can just analyze. And, mm -hmm. you know, and what she talked about uh, in uh, Icelandic, maybe it's also not the only question about class, conscious, but about timing. Mm -hmm. And that Foucault doesn't talk about, mm -hmm. and he can't yeah. predict. So history. I think it's better also sometimes to, you can see, so you don't have to be, oh, oh, I was just. Yeah, so I guess, well, when we use Foucault, I think, you know, despite uh, the, the problematic of understanding history as, uh, you know, in a way, sometimes you can make a claim that, uh, you know, he, he tries to refute enlightenment. Yeah, and, and this yeah. is a problem in science yeah. and technology communities because you have movements that predicate on, the fu on, on reason and at the same time they function politically in, in, in a way that they refute reason that brought them together. So, but I, I think that Foucault, despite that he doesn't have this, uh, and the heterotopia is quite unopened, you know, it can be interpreted in many ways, um, uh, 
And despite that, I think that Fugois uh, is uh, kind of useful on, on, on how power, on how to, to think about power, yeah? Uh, without meaning that, uh, you know, I, I disagree with uh, his idea, for example, that, you know, you cannot have an outside. I think that uh, radical social change can, can't happen. And I think timing is also an important thing as well. I mean, uh, sometimes political, uh, political time is very slow. It can, you, you know, you can, uh, uh, have a, a, a process uh, of 10 years and then in just one month or two months you have uh, political events that uh, happen in so fast way that you didn't have in 10 years. Yeah? So I don't know if I answered the question but you know. <laughs> I hope I just uh, create some, um, uh, some questions about you know let's just you know Bring the engineers in. The engineers in the 70s were very, were very radical. You know, and I, I, when I, whenever I go to hack spaces, I don't see. I, I see people that do not have the knowledge of this history. In the UK, there was the radical science movement. In the US, and uh, they were destroyed essentially by the Reagan and the Thatcher administration. You know, it was just 25 years ago. Right, and uh, the new generation of uh, of scientists. I, I cannot understand uh, how uh, the idea of entrepreneurship uh, seduces them more than the idea of social justice. Yeah? So I think it's an, it's an important, you know, aside from, uh, from poems and arts, I, I think that engineers should also read Marx, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can, they can decide on their own what happens next. And, you know, politics is not everybody having the, the, the same ideas at the same time, but it's a, it's a conflict within societies and conflict characterizes wow. societies. So I think hack spaces should not uh, be spaces that, you know, they try to deny this conflict that happens in society. They should take a stance. On, you know. If there are no more questions, there will be a short uh, pause before the next brief pause before the next uh, talk, which starts uh, quarter past.